Welcome to the Mindspace Podcast. I'm Joe Flanders. Thanks for tuning in. My guest today is Professor Robert Copeland. Rob is a professor in the Department of Psychology at Carleton University in Ottawa, and he's also the director of the Pickering Center for Research in Human Development. Rob is well known for his research on shyness, social withdrawal, and social anxiety in kids. He's published hundreds of journal articles and book chapters and several books, including his two most recent entitled Quiet at School and The Handbook of Solitude. In addition to his impressive academic credentials, he's also very active in the community, educating schools and teachers on the best practices for supporting children's social and emotional development. So as you're about to hear, he's got tons of practical advice for parents and teachers. In our discussion, we talked about the nature of shyness and its biological bases. We talked about the extent to which shy children are vulnerable to mental health problems later in life and what interventions can help them. We reviewed some recommendations to parents for best supporting shy children, and we discussed adolescence, specifically how parents might manage a teenagers' academic anxiety and their smartphone use. I'll just mention briefly that if you have any concerns about your own child's anxiety, mood, or behavior, Mindspace can help. For example, your child might benefit from a psychoeducational assessment or cognitive behavior therapy with Alessandro Vizzino or mindfulness training with Netta Rothstein. And parents can pick up some tools from one of our parenting coaches. Please consult the Child and Adolescent Services page on the Mindspace website, mindspacewellbeing.com, or you can book an appointment by writing to info at mindspacewellbeing.com or calling 514-481-0317. You might also consider bringing your little one to a kid's meditation class at Presence, our drop-in studio. Information is available at presencemeditation.ca. Okay, and now for my conversation with Professor Robert Copeland. So, hey Rob, welcome to the podcast. Hey Joe, happy to be here. Uh, I think I'll start by just asking you what you do and a little bit about how you got into what you do. Sure. Uh, Well, I'm a professor in the psychology department at Carleton University in Ottawa, uh, and I'm the director of the Pickering Research Center for uh, Research in Human Development. I've been at Carleton for, oh gosh, 23 years, so quite a while there. Um, Originally from Montreal, actually. Grew up uh, in Côte Saint-Luc, not too far from here, where we are recording this podcast. And uh, I guess I got interested in working with kids when I spent my summers at Hampstead Day Camp. I made my way up to the ranks many, many summers of being a you know, CIT and a junior counselor and a counselor. In the last few years, I was the director of that camp. Uh, and that was really my first formal experience working with kids. And I guess that planted the seeds uh, of a lot of the stuff that I still work with today. Well, what about those experiences working with kids at the camp um, specifically got you into doing the research? Yeah, well, in the last few years when I was the director, the director's job is a little bit like being the principal at school. So when there's a problem with any of the kids, they sometimes end up in your office. Uh, And, you know, for every five or six or seven kids that would show up in my office because they hit somebody or they wouldn't sit still or, you know, they were bouncing off the walls, there would be a counselor who would bring in a young child who wouldn't talk to anybody, who was being really quiet or didn't want to play, who was, you know, maybe being a little bit nervous uh, at camp. And I found myself with a personal interest just in, in, you know, working with those kids a little bit one-on-one and trying to figure out what was going on inside their heads that would make them feel that way. And little did I know it at the time, but that's where a lot of my original ideas about working with shy and withdrawn kids came from, from those sort of personal experiences of just trying out stuff to see what may, might, might work to sort of get them to come out of their shell a little bit. All right. So we're into now the topics of your research. Mm-hmm. Um, why don't you tell us what you're into? Um, it sounds like you started out... Um, particularly uh, looking into shyness. And I know it's evolved quite a bit, but maybe you could just tell us a little bit about that trajectory. Sure. So when I did my graduate work at the University of Waterloo, I had the very good fortune of working with Dr. Ken Rubin, who was really, uh, and still to this day remains, you know, a leading expert in uh, the study of children's social and emotional development. Uh, And he was particularly a pioneer in understanding children's peer relationships and was one of the big voices convincing people that it's really important to study what goes on with our friends, what goes on with our peers when we grow up, and you know what 
critical and unique experiences we have with our friends from a very young age that help us and support us in a way that we just can't get from anyone else. So of course, relationships with parents, crucially important relationships with siblings and other family members and teachers, but there's something about the peer group that provides kids with a set of experiences and a context for learning that they do in a very different way uh, and, and in a very special way from all these other sorts of experiences. Uh, and it was from learning about the importance of those experiences that I started to get interested in kids who were missing out on those experiences for one reason or another. And I guess the first group of kids that we looked at were those sort of classic shy kids who were feeling too nervous and anxious to, to engage and play, and what might the consequences of that be? So I know you've written volumes on this, but what exactly is shyness? Yeah, so w- when I talk to parents about shyness, I try to present it as basically just, it's, you know, it's a temperamental trait. It's part of our personality. So a temperamental trait is something that we come into the world with. Uh, temperamental differences in how we react to the environment are present right from birth. Um, and so it's something that is kind of born with, something that is relatively stable across uh, our childhood and into adolescence and adulthood. Um, and I guess the easiest way to think about it is it's the temperament is your building blocks for your later personality. Um, and so shyness is a temperamental trait. It's a way of responding to the environment. And for shy kids, it has to do with really two main sorts of reactions. So for young kids, the youngest kids, shyness is mostly about feeling nervous and anxious in new situations, encountering new people, meeting uh, unfamiliar adults or other kids. Uh, And shy kids, basically, the way that I would talk to parents about it, I would say they have a nervous system that's wired a little bit too tight. So it's almost as if their nervous system is telling them that something scary is about to jump out from around the corner all the time. Uh, And so because they're wired a little bit tight, uh, when they encounter a new person, they encounter that as stressful. They feel a little bit, you know, wary in those kinds of situations. And their nervous system is sort of set to go off. It's as if, you know, it's anticipating something bad or scary to happen. Uh, and it's pretty easy to imagine how those kinds of, you know, physical responses, physiological responses where your, you know, heart rate is going a little bit faster and you're breathing a little bit faster, you know, those easily connect into thoughts about this is scary and feelings uh, of anxiousness. And all those things get kind of mashed together so that when these shy kids are meeting a new person, they, they just automatically settle into this kind of, you know, wary and nervous response. You mentioned that with sh- with shyness it's it tends to be specifically about other people but then you said earlier um that it could be new situations or other there are other categories of threat mm-hmm. yeah so there's i mean there's different ways of characterizing shy responses certainly when we're talking about the the personality trait of shyness it usually focuses on something social social new things um but other people look about response to novelty a little bit more generally so any kind of new situation a new you know a new environment a child playing with a new toy uh going into a you know a new classroom anything that that has that novelty to it can also be threatening but i would say you know those people who focus on shyness specifically would definitely uh want to include the social part the uh, the presence of other people um so that kind of early responding shyness uh is typical to young children's social experiences they a lot of stuff is new for young kids. So it's certainly not uh, a surprise to think that there's a certain proportion of kids in you know, our species who respond a little bit more reactively when they meet new situations. And evolutionarily speaking, this is not necessarily a bad thing, right? It is probably good for our species as a whole that not everybody is bouncing off the wall extroverted, not everybody is jumping right in, is super outgoing, super sociable. It's nice to have some of those people around. It's also nice from a species perspective, to have another group of people who's a little bit more cautious, who's a little bit more sensitive to threats in the environment, they look a little bit before they leap, right? There's a reason why today, after all of these years of evolution, we still have a wide range of shyness trait in our species, because evolutionarily speaking, there's there's adaptive qualities of all the way along that 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 range of, of personality. Well, so what are the adaptive qualities of being a little more shy or a little uh more likely to look before you leap well you can imagine all kinds of situations people have done research in in animals and etc where uh, there's a great study of shy fish Mm -hmm. where if the fish are in a predator heavy environment so if they happen to be in a pond where there are lots of frogs or bigger fish that are going to eat them the shy fish and there are such things are more likely to survive because they at the first sign of threat they will flee uh, and from an evolutionary perspective that's a survival mechanism in in an environment where there's threat uh, other people have suggested that shy traits 
uh, are good for diffusing uh, potentially socially risky uh, and violent situations uh, because you can diffuse a threatful situation by being a little bit more docile and not being as threatening in your own response, which can lead to community building. Um, and so there's a number of different sort of evolutionary perspectives to suggest that these kinds of traits are helpful to have in the species. Uh, and I think we can think of lots of reasons for kids why it's good to be a little bit more pensive sometimes, why it's good to think a little bit more before we respond. Uh, that sensitivity to other people's thoughts, that sensitivity to other people's feelings can certainly, you know, there's room for that in, in our society today for sure. Uh, and, you know, sensitivity can lead to empathy and sympathy. Uh, and again, there's definitely room for that in our society. I want to try to nail down the vocabulary a bit because when I hear you talk about shyness, I feel like I can just substitute the word anxiety and have the exact same conversation. And then maybe shyness is uh, uh, an anxiety in social situations. Maybe we can call it social anxiety. So maybe you can tease that apart for me. Sure. So, I mean, there's quite a bit of continued debate about these two different terms, the difference between shyness and social anxiety, the difference between shyness as a personality trait and some of these clinical disorders that have to meet diagnostic criteria. So, and again, if I'm thinking about uh, uh, parents as an audience for explaining this, shyness is a personality trait and it's neither good nor bad. Okay. Uh, and when we do intervention programs and we're trying to help kids who might be feeling shy or anxious, the number one important message I want to communicate to parents is that we're not trying to change your child's personality, uh, that there's nothing inherently good or bad about being shy. There's all different kinds of personalities out there. People are different in a whole bunch of different ways. Uh, and these are not necessarily good or bad things. This is what makes you know, humans interesting is that we have these kinds of differences. But in the case of shyness, sometimes the way that they respond to situations, so I talked about novelty before, another dimension of shyness can be feeling self-conscious, being feeling uncomfortable when you are the center of attention, when you're perceiving that you're being evaluated. So if I was a shy person and I was talking into a microphone and being recorded and I knew that this was going to be played out for people later, I might feel particularly self-conscious. I might be sitting here thinking like, oh my goodness, you know, Joe is sitting across the couch from me and he's thinking I'm not a very good guest. He's thinking that I'm not very interesting. Uh, I better be really careful about what I'm going to say. It's easy to have those kinds of negative thoughts. Um, and so uh, another aspect of uh, shyness when kids get a little bit older is this sort of self-consciousness and this tendency to interpret uh, you know, uh, maybe less than clear events in, in a more negative way. Now, again, these are personality aspects that don't necessarily lead to good or bad things. There can be circumstances where if uh, you're feeling particularly shy in a situation that it can start to interfere. And I think that interference component, as a lot of clinicians will tell you, is really what separates out a dimension of personality from any kind of sort of clinical disorder. So here's an example I give to my uh, students when we talk about uh, shyness versus social anxiety in class. So if I was a shy student in one of my seminar classes and I was told that I had to give a presentation next week, that would make me nervous. And I would go home and I would fret about that and I would worry about it and I would probably prepare a lot and I would spend a lot of time practicing and I would feel not so good about my chances of doing it. And the night before, I would practice in front of the mirror and I would blush and I would feel very uncomfortable. And the next morning, I would come to class, probably not having slept that well. And then I would stand up to do my presentation and probably my face would be a little bit red. I'd be sweating. I would be thinking about how everybody in the class is thinking I'm not very smart and the teacher's going to not give me a good grade. And soon they're going to realize that I'm a fraud. And I don't really deserve to be in this class. And, you know, I've just been fooling them this whole time. But I would give the presentation. And probably to the outside eye, it would look a lot better than what it felt to me on the inside. And maybe when I got some encouraging feedback from my uh, professor, which is certainly something that I would try to do, uh, I would feel like, okay, that was hard, but I survived. And maybe the next time it would be just a little bit easier. Okay? So that's someone who tends to be shy. It has some impact on how they cope with things, but they're able to function under the regular demands of, of you know, what our society is asking them to do. If someone was suffering from social anxiety disorder, if they found out that there was a presentation in, in my class, they would drop the class and perhaps maybe not even be able to go to school on a regular basis because the pressures and perceived pressures of being in that social environment every day would be too much for them to be able to, to cope. So there's a difference between, you know, having to overcome an obstacle and but still being able to do it versus this kind of life interference that really will threaten your day-to-day -day functioning. And people who have social anxiety disorder can suffer tremendously uh, and it can it can completely disrupt their ability to live what we would call you know sort of accomplish regular normal life goals life events regular activities because they're crippled by these uh, by these self doubts and fears. So you know some people would characterize shyness and social anxiety on a continuum. 
certainly there is some uh, you know, connection between the two people who are shy when they're young. They are at increased risk for later developing social anxiety disorder, but the vast majority of people who are shy when they're young don't go on to do that. Um, so I'm in the camp that there's a sort of a qualitative difference between, you know, a personality trait that varies along normative dimensions, and then you have that extreme version, perhaps, that sort of disconnects from, uh, from that continuum. So I want to come back to the word anxiety here, um, because uh, the way you're talking about it now, you sort of interpreted it more in a clinical sense, like mm-hmm. social anxiety disorder. Mm-hmm. Um, another sort of use or meaning of the word is just a, an affective state right? or even a psychophysiological state. Mm-hmm. And so again, why couldn't shyness just be another word for, I know there's a, this has a technical reference, but behavioral inhibition right. or just a state of the nervous system that is a response to threat. Right. So what is the difference between that notion of anxiety and shyness? Yeah, so, I mean, behavioral inhibition is actually, that term probably predates the shyness literature to some, they, this is, you're talking about Jerome Kagan, who's sort of the historical researcher who introduced that term, and uh, I would call shyness uh, almost like a specific subtype of behavioral inhibition. So behavioral inhibition, and, and I alluded to this earlier, is really focusing on the broader construct of novelty. So when Jerome Kagan would, did his earlier studies of, he brought, you know, preschool age kids into the lab, and he was interested in specifically their response to novelty, uh, and but some of the things that they would respond to would be, you know, a toy robot uh, or he would ask them to go through a tunnel uh, and he would give them sort of physical and motor challenges and he would put them in a new environment without other people around. And so he was interested in threat perception to novelty as the generating factor of, of that threat. Um, and again, what I think separates shyness from that broader category is shyness is specifically focused on the social component of these things. Um, and again, when you're talking about elevated you know, if someone scores high on a personality inventory with a shyness dimension and they take a social anxiety uh, assessment that is looking at elevated, but let's say subclinical levels of social anxiety, boy, it, it starts to get blurry. There, there's no question that it starts to get blurry. But And there are pathways that connect shyness and social anxiety that you can trace back to infancy. So there is definitely a pathway where a child is born with this heightened behavioral inhibition and when they are young, they respond to novelty in a reactive way. And when they are three or four years old and they start to develop their self-system enough to appreciate that other people can see the world differently than them, they also come to appreciate that other people might not be thinking good things about them. And that elevates their anxiety and negative feelings about you know, self-presentation uh, issues and being self-conscious when they're the center of attention. And that leads into later childhood and adolescence to elevated feelings of social anxiety. So all that, there's a clear path that has been very well demonstrated that sort of directly connects these temperamental traits, these personality characteristics with symptoms of social anxiety later. However, not everybody who shows s- clinical or elevated but subclinical symptoms of social anxiety have a history of that kind of shyness or personality, mm-hmm. right? So other people may have, maybe they had a traumatic event uh, maybe it was a traumatic social event that triggered these kinds of responses, or there are lots of other sort of ideologies, pathways, predictive uh, experiences that might lead to the experience of anxiety or social anxiety, particularly that don't connect to shyness. So, I mean, y- you've raised some really interesting questions. These kinds of debates about how we can conceptualize, differentiate, measure, operationalize these two terms. The whole literature is muddled by, mm-hmm. you know, people using the same terms overlap with in their meaning and certainly if you look at the measures you look at a measure of social anxiety in my field and a measure of shyness and you could swap items and nobody would notice the difference right so there's no question that there's muddiness there but i think again if we're trying to get this to the level where parents and teachers are going to understand um i'd like to try to think about personality as something that the child you know this is something personal about them that they bring into the world that they is part of who they are And some of those personality traits might make them more vulnerable to experience anxiety. But you can be a shy person and and develop positive coping strategies, get support from parents and teachers and peers, and then you have zero connection with anxiety, Mm -hmm. right? So you might have an initial physiological response. So if I'm a shy person and I stand up to speak in front of a crowd, my initial, you know, knee-jerk physiological reaction might still be oh "Oh my goodness this is scary and then i remember oh yeah wait i know how to do this Mm -hmm. i've done it before it's going to be okay i take a deep breath and i'm good to go and on the outside i don't look nervous 
I'm not blushing. I'm not sweating. Uh, I'm not, you know, I'm making eye contact with my audience. And maybe in the back of my mind somewhere, I'm still thinking a little bit, wow, this is a bit scary, but I, I'm coping well and, and it's not interfering with anything that I want to do. And there, there's a disconnect between your sort of initial psychophysiological temperamental substrates and, and how it's expressed as anxiety. So one more wrinkle in the vocabulary here. What about the approach avoidance conflict, which I understand is core to shyness and is not necessarily invoked when you're talking about anxiety? Right. So, yeah, so this this goes back to, oh, well, I mean, Gray was the original uh, theorist who talked about these uh, behavioral inhibition and behavioral activation systems. Uh, but most of the work in the personality area on this has been done by a guy uh, from Munich by the name of Jens Assendorf. Uh, and he took that work that was looking at general, uh, uh, you know, approach to reward and avoidance of punishment, and he put it into the social realm. And he talked about these social approach motivations and social avoidance motivations. Uh, and so for shy kids, the idea here is that shy kids are interested in others. Okay? So they want to play. They are. They have the desire to affiliate. So imagine a young, uh, you know, preschool child on the playground, and he sees some other kids playing in the sandbox so he's interested he wants to kind of be part of that so he starts to walk over and see what's going on that's the social approach motivation he's motivated he's interested he wants to play okay but at the same time that's a bit of a threatening situation for someone who's shy so there's new kids maybe he doesn't know them he's not sure what he's going to say and as he starts to get closer that reactivity pumps up a little bit so his his heart starts to beat a little bit faster and he's sweating a little bit and he's thinking, mm, what am I going to say to these kids? Maybe they're not going to like me. What if they don't let me play? Uh, what if I stumble on my words when I get there? And those sorts of fears are starting to push back and tell him, that's scary, go away from it. Okay? So now you've got what they call this approach avoidance conflict. I want to play, but I'm scared. I want to play, but I'm scared. And we would see that behaviorally by, by watching this shy child get closer and closer, but then the closer he gets, the more intense the negative component becomes, and eventually they sort of freeze, right? And they can't resolve. I can't go forward, but I don't want to go back. And so behaviorally, what we would, what we would observe would be a child who's watching from a distance, right? Who is what we would call onlooking. They're, they're monitoring the situation. They're watching the other children play. They're clearly interested, but they won't take that next step to sort of initiate. And I think that kind of motivational component to understanding shyness is really important, particularly for understanding that shy kids are interested in playing, which I think is something that we try to build upon because they, if they find social interaction rewarding, what we want to do when we're thinking about moving forward and making them feel more comfortable is just get them to experience positive social events, get them to have some, even the slightest advance in a small uh, way of a social experience that will be rewarding to them, will, will make them want to do it more. Um, so it gives us some hints about how we might want to intervene, which I assume we'll talk about in a little while. But the other way that this is also interesting, it, it differentiates shy kids from other children who might not be off playing with others, which is a, a more recent distinction, which I think is also really important. So if we are looking at kids who are off by themselves on the playground, the general assumption for a long time was that these kids were shy, right? And that's why they're off playing by themselves. But there's these other group of kids that I've also become really interested in over the years. And these are the kids who might be playing by themselves, but they're, they're quite content to do so. Okay? So they are choosing, right? They have an intrinsic motivation. They are choosing to play by themselves because they like it. It's a non-fearful preference for solitary activities. Uh, and so these kids might uh, be you know, playing by themselves in the sandbox and they don't have a strong motivation to go over and play with others, but on the same they also don't have a strong fear or, or avoidance motivation. Okay, so it's so from the motivational perspective, they're low on approach. They could take it or leave it, but they're also low on avoid, which means if they get an attractive invitation, if someone comes up and asks them to play, sure, I'll go over and play with them, play with them for a while, and then when they're done, they'll go back and play by themselves. Um, and so they can move fluidly between these sort of opportunities for social interaction, uh, but for whatever reason, and I think the reasons are quite interesting to speculate about, they're just quite happy to, to spend time by themselves. So this is this really interesting question of solitude, which I think you've gotten into more recently, mm. and um, I think you've published at least one book about this recently. Um, what else do we know about kids that enjoy solitude, and do we need to worry about them, or do they have some... Is, that, is there a valuable aspect of their temperament that they can enjoy time alone? Um, and of course, uh, on that note, I'm really interested, of course, in, in meditation and mindfulness, which mm -hmm. is a, a, an activity that's typically done in solitude, 
and I'm very aware of all the benefits um, that children can enjoy if they can learn to appreciate that quiet time. Yeah, so there, I mean, there's a there's quite a long history uh, of negative publicity about spending time alone, especially when you're a kid. Uh, and I guess even, you know, my former supervisor, Ken Rubin, who I talked about before, was one of the leaders in establishing all the reasons why it might not be so good to spend time alone. Uh, although, you know, I've, I've asked him how he's felt about that sort of historically because it, you know, his argument was always peers are so important. We learn so much from hanging out with our peers that if we are spending too much time by ourselves, no matter what the motivation is, that can come at a cost. So, for example, peers help young children learn social skills, cooperation, negotiation, solving conflicts. They help them develop sympathy and empathy. They help them reduce their egocentrism, which means they help them understand and realize that other kids think and believe and feel different things than they do. These are all sort of critical tasks of childhood to develop these kinds of skills. Peers help us. Uh, you know, in our language development, they provide us all kinds of support. They provide us with, you know, the ability to experience intimacy and joy in a very sort of unique way. So it's all this great stuff that we get from hanging out with our friends. And so I guess the, the, the point has always been, if we get all this great stuff from hanging out with kids, if we're not hanging out with them as much as we should be, then there might be some cumulative cost. So even if we are a well-adjusted, socially competent, happy kid, happy to spend time by ourselves, if we are not spending enough time with others and we're not getting whatever that minimum level of social interaction is, even if we're not having any issues now, over the years, we might come to lag behind uh, the acquisition and implementation of these great, amazing things and skills that we get from hanging out with our friends. So, and then we might end up running into trouble later on because we haven't kept up with our peers in terms of the expectations for what the quality and quantity of social interaction is gonna be. As kids get older, the stakes go up, People expect more in terms of how you're going to be able to engage with them. Expectations and norms go up in terms of what a social interaction is going to look like. And you got to practice that stuff. It doesn't just happen naturally. And so I guess if we don't practice it, there's a danger that we could lose it or not be able to learn it as well as our peers. And that could be potentially problematic. So for me, that's really the primary reason why we might be at least somewhat concerned about kids who are too much you know, on their own. Um, and I guess it's always important, especially from a parent perspective, to understand sort of the reasons why kids might be spending time alone. So we've talked about two different kinds of, you know, pathways that might lead kids to spend time alone. The shy child who wants to play, but they're scared. Uh, and so they might be off by themselves because they're sort of too nervous to interact with others. So that's something that parents can certainly help with. And we could talk about that later. Uh, then there are these kids who are just quite happy to spend time by themselves. And, you know, so w what we would probably suggest in that case is just you want to monitor and make sure that they're still getting at least some social interaction and that, uh, you know, they're keeping up in terms of that ability to do that. Um, there's a third group, I guess, that we could think about would be are spending time by themselves because uh, they are being pushed out. OK, so this is sort of a separate group of kids that are uh, spending time alone for more external factors. These are kids who are excluded, rejected, victimized. And they're, you know, a short form of saying that would be they're, they're playing alone because nobody wants to play with them. Uh, and, you know, unfortunately, the long term consequences of that can be quite devastating uh, because you have the combination of missing out on these opportunities for social interaction combined with the, you know, the incredible pain that can be caused by being ostracized. Um, and so in those kinds of circumstances, of course, we're talking about m more of a, a need to help. Uh, both with the child's own ability to interact and trying to change the context so that they can uh, they can engage in more positive social interaction. So, you know, before we focus on these kids who sort of like to play alone, I just want to kind of make sure that parents have this idea that there are, you know, a whole bunch of different sort of reasons why kids may spend time by themselves. And, not, you know, some of them are, are more concerning than others, but it's important to try to understand at least some of the rationale behind them. When kids get older, especially for teenagers, if they're spending a lot of time alone, it might be because they're feeling depressed. Um, that's another kind of warning sign is that if you are removing yourself from and avoiding social situations, it might be because, you know, uh, especially for, for adolescents, uh, you know, you, you, there, might, there might not be as, uh, as many positive reasons there for withdrawing. So again, it's, it's on us as parents and teachers and friends to sort of keep an eye up on our friends uh, to make sure that, you know, that time spent alone is, is you know, uh, under the most positive sort of circumstances. Okay, so may maybe you could tell us a bit more about the developmental trajectories 
of these different categories of kids. So there's shy kids. Mm -hmm. um, there's kids that are happy playing alone. There are kids that are uh, maybe left out and other kids don't want to play with them. What do these kids look like in adolescence and in adulthood? Okay, so I guess, and I have been very guilty of this since the beginning of our conversation, but just by the way that you phrased that question, it, it, it tweaked me to something. I would actually, you know, I, I actually hate when we put a label on a child by calling them the shy kid or the, you know, the unsociable kid. Uh, and I realize I've probably said that term multiple times. It's easy to let it flow into our general conversation. Uh, but I think I'll interrupt our talk for a second just to, you know, one of the most important pieces of advice that I start with parents when it comes to talking about their children who might feel shy is to disconnect that label from the child. So uh, for anyone who has, you know, had a child who they think might be somewhat shy, and, you know, I think part of the reason why I say shy child is just because it's, it's, it's less cumbersome than saying child who is high on the personality trait of shyness, right? So, um, but... So that's why I sometimes fall into saying that myself. But in the presence of these kids, I think there is a real potential pitfall in labeling them in that way and uh, for a very sort of specific set of reasons. So, for example, uh, let's say that you are a parent of a, you know, a five-year-old girl who sometimes is nervous uh, when they meet new people. And you're out for a walk and you come upon a friend who this child hasn't met before. And you introduce your child to your friend and you ask them to say hello. And your daughter, you know, hides her face behind your back and refuses to say something. So this is a very common situation for many parents of young kids, regardless of how, you know, shy they might be. I think it probably happens almost to everybody. And you'll be amazed about how often the person that you are interacting with will be quick to label your child as shy, right? So uh, in this case, your friend might say, oh, I see she's shy, right? Or even parents will do this as a defense mechanism or as just as an automatic response, oh, it's okay, she's just shy. Okay. So let's think about what that means for the child when they hear that under that kind of circumstances. So on the one thing, when children are young and they're developing their sense of self, a lot of the input for determining their sense of self comes from important people around them. So things that they hear about themselves from their parents, from their friends, from their teachers, they internalize that and that becomes part of their self-concept. So if a child is constantly hearing from their mother or father that I'm shy, then that's what they're believing. Okay, I guess I'm shy. And I think the other component of that that is important to address is that it also kinds of lets them off the hook a little bit, right? So the parent is communicating the message to them that says, you're shy, and shy people don't say hello to anybody else. And so it puts a label on them, and it recluses them from having to do anything about it, okay? Um, and when we talk to parents about trying to shape these behaviors and change these behaviors and equip children with coping strategies that are going to allow them to, you know, eventually reach the goals of these sorts of social interactions that we're aiming for, that's the opposite of that. So what I actually ask parents to do is to ch stop labeling their child as shy themselves. And not only that, but to actually challenge that response when they hear it from others, because you're going to definitely hear it from others. So in that exact same anecdote, uh, if the friend that you were introducing your child to said, oh, I see that she's shy, my response suggestion to the parent would be to say something like, well, actually, sometimes she takes a little while before she feels comfortable to talk when she meets a new person. It's okay with me. She can take a few minutes, and then a few minutes from now, she'll you know, say hi, or she'll wave, or she'll smile at you. Okay? And this is a great message for the kid because it makes them understand that you, as a parent, respect and understand their feelings. And, and you are acknowledging them and you are validating them that it's okay for them to feel nervous sometimes when they meet a new person. But the other part of that is that you're also establishing an expectation that I understand your feelings and it's okay for you to feel that way, but at the same time, I'm going to push you just a little bit. In a few minutes when you feel better, I have an expectation that you're going to do something. Maybe it's not say hello. Maybe it's just look at them in the eye. Maybe it's just wave, but something to show me that even when you feel that way, it's still important to try your best to try to act in a brave way. And those kinds of words, I think, are really important for kids to hear that it's okay to feel this way, but sometimes even when you feel this way, you still have to act in this way. That's really cool. Obviously, this has happened to me with my daughters. And as you're telling the story, I'm sort of thinking about how I deal with it. And I realize what I typically do is I say, 
hey, are you being shy? <laughs> Which is to say, you're not normally mm-hmm. inhibited like this. Right. So what are you doing? Yeah. So it does communicate the sense. So like, first of all, you are not this label. Yeah. Two, it communicates an expectation that like you shouldn't be behaving this way, mm-hmm. but it doesn't validate how they feel. It right. actually does the opposite. It's mm-hmm. like you're doing something wrong right now. Right now, I mean, this sort of approach, I guess, was kind of pioneered among work with aggressive kids and, and around anger, right? Where the message to kids who were having a temper tantrum and, and you know, hitting someone was that it's okay to be mad and it's okay to be frustrated, but even when you're mad, it's not okay to punch this guy in the face. Okay? So this is sort of adapting that same kind of uh, of approach to say to kids, you validate the feelings, you acknowledge the feeling. This comes out of the emotion coaching, the emotion socialization work of Gottman and others, right? You validate the feelings. All feelings are okay. There's no such thing as a bad feeling, okay? There are a lot of parents who are uncomfortable around, around strong emotions in their kids, even positive emotions, right? They're always saying to their kids, you know, stop crying, you know, calm down, settle down, right? E- any kind of strong emotion, positive or negative, might make them uncomfortable so they try to dismiss it and and miniaturize it okay instead what we would hope uh, so what i think was more sort of an adaptive response would be to acknowledge the feeling validate the feeling and and it's always okay to feel however you feel okay but at the same time you place some limits right so even but even when you feel this way it's not okay to behave in this way and so for the angry kid it's it's okay to be angry but it's not okay to hit so what are some other ways that we can help you respond and feel and cope with these feelings of anger that are better okay with fear and anxiety or shyness it's it's okay to feel nervous it's okay to feel self-conscious but sometimes even when you feel that way you still have to say hi to this person or if you can't say hi something a wave a fist bump a high five a s- make eye contact right uh and you know p- establishing that normative expectation uh, of brave behavior in the face of these of these fearful feelings and it, it's important for kids to understand that being brave does not mean not being scared right it's easy to act brave if you're not feeling scared that's not being brave right being brave is behaving in a certain way even though you feel scared yeah so this is really great stuff and i definitely want to get more of your sort of recommendations about how to handle think handle these things particularly if we can put it in the context of, you know, let's say the risk factors or the vulnerabilities that pe- that kids have if they are shy or, right. w- or you know, whatever the observed behavior is, um, and then the things that we could do to change the trajectory for the better. I would say in terms of, you know, so temperamental shyness is sort of a risk factor or a vulnerability for anxiety. But as I said before, and I, I want to really emphasize this, the vast majority of kids who might you know, be described as extremely shy when they're young, don't go on to have these kinds of difficulties, but some do. Uh, And so there's been a lot of work done to look at what are the sort of things that alter those trajectories? What are the kinds of things, you know, as parents, our goal is to set our kids up with the kinds of coping strategies that they're going to need, that are going to serve them for the rest of their life to make them happy, healthy, and and well-adjusted. And that's really the message for parents of these kids who are shy, right? It's like an investment that you're going to make, things that you're going to teach them that they're going to use for their whole life. Because if they are born with a nervous system that always responds with a, (laughs) when they uh, encounter a new situation, that's probably not going to change. But It doesn't have to change. What has to potentially change is their ability to cope with that initial feeling when it happens. So for parents, one very sort of understandable way that a lot of parents respond to their child when they behave in a shy way is, I mean, they get worried about them and they get protective of them. Now, this is a pretty understandable (laughs) response. I mean, you're a parent. You want to protect your child at all costs, right? And particularly if you perceive them as vulnerable, then you are definitely going to want to protect them no matter what. Um, And so it's like it's hard, you know, it's hard to not respond in that protective way because you're immediately thinking if your child is looking scared or nervous or upset, you want to do anything you can in the moment to make them not upset. And any parent would want to do that. So I want to start off by saying that, of of course, parents respond in that way. It's it's a very instinctual. It's a gut way to respond to to that behavior. Um, What can happen sometimes over the long term is that parents are jumping in a bit too much and a bit too early uh, with this, again, with good intentions, right? My intention is to, you know, stop my child from crying because they're scared. So you can imagine situations where 
the shy child who tends to be shy is encountering or about to encounter, you know, uh, let's say they're going to a birthday party. Here's a classic example of what might be a stressful situation for a shy child. Okay, so they arrive at a birthday party and there's a whole bunch of new people and it's loud and it's noisy and, and you know, it's a social setting. Uh, and a parent might already be nervous about this because based on their past experiences, they know that this is a threatful situation for their child. Uh, and so they might be anxious themselves and might be looking anxious themselves even if they don't realize it. So one thing that's happening is the child is picking up on that anxiousness and modeling it and responding to it and becoming more anxious because they see that their parent is anxious. So that's something that we try to get parents to understand is that you know they need to you know take a few deep breaths themselves and try to uh, you know understand a little bit of their own emotional responses to the perception of threat of their child because another thing that parents will do is they will just highlight all of these threats in the environment for their kids right okay now when you get to the party it's gonna be okay now don't worry but you know you be careful about this person and this dog and you know you can pet him but don't go too close <laughs> because you know he's got a big mouth and he's got sharp teeth but it's okay he's gonna be a really nice dog but don't worry it's just gonna be fine and this person's gonna be there and look out for that and be careful of this and you know it, we talk to our kids a lot about threat without realizing it on a day-to-day -day basis but if you have a child who's already prone to focus on threat in their environment and you're highlighting all those threats left and right you are now emphasizing, exacerbating, amplifying all of those threats. Okay. So now you've got a situation where the child who's already prone to be shy is modeling anxious behaviors in their parents, is having their perception of threats, which is already kind of skewed, amplified by having parents point out all of these sorts of threats. Okay. So that's like strike two. And then when they start to get upset, their parents' initial goal, understandably so, is to solve this problem right away. And the easiest way to solve this problem right away is to solve the problem for them or remove them from the threatening situation. Let's go home from the birthday party. Or somebody asks your child a question and you answer for them because you know that they're feeling too anxious. And again, in the short term, this works, right? You remove them from this threatening situation and they feel better, okay? In the long term, you're probably working against, uh, you know, long-term gain because if you are always jumping in and solving the problem for your child or removing them from the situation, they are never developing their own coping strategies, their own personal repertoire of skills that will allow them to deal with these sorts of feelings. And then when they hit school and you're not there to help them anymore, th then things can go really bad, right? If they are depending upon you to solve all these problems for them or to protect them from these situations, when they start school and they are in a classroom full of 20 kids and the teacher's calling upon them in class, and kids are coming up to them at recess and lunch and talking to them and asking them to do things, and they have not had enough of those experiences to deal with that initial, you know, uh, threat, that initial difficultness of those situations, then it can really spiral out of control. And so I guess the number one advice I would give, and it's a broad sort of parenting approach, a socialization approach, is that, you know, Sometimes your child needs to experience a little bit of these things. And again, how much is a little bit really varies from child to child. But they need to experience a little bit of these challenges so that they can learn that they can overcome these challenges. And of course, at the beginning, they're going to need a huge amount of support and assistance to overcome even the tiniest little bit of that challenge. And when they make that tiny little step forward, you get a huge amount of love and support and praise and how wonderful and how brave they were. And over time, the more that you can support and reinforce those positive, brave behaviors, uh, the more you can equip them with these kinds of strategies for dealing with those feelings when they have them, the more that you can acknowledge and support their feelings, but also encourage them to act even when they feel that way. Step by step, you're equipping them with exactly the kinds of toolboxes of skills that they're going to need to move forward. What can you tell us about the impact of these kinds of strategies? So like maybe what is the incidence of shyness in children and what are the trajectories of development for these kids and how successful can we be in preventing um, some of these vulnerabilities from turning into more serious problems as they get older? Well, the good news is that uh, anxiety in general and social anxiety as well is one of the most treatable forms of uh, mental health difficulties that we have, which is Wonderful, right? There are very effective techniques uh, for children of all ages and adolescents and adults that have been proven extraordinarily 
successful in overall in terms of reducing symptoms of anxiety. Um, one of the larger issues, of course, is that for whatever reason, whether it's stigma or uh, you know, or uh, lack of motivation to, to change, the vast majority of, of kids and, and adolescents and adults who are suffering from you know, subclinical or clinical levels of anxiety never seek any form of treatment, which is, to me is a, is a crisis of epic proportion. It's, it's, it's so sad to me that people are living with these you know, sometimes crippling anxieties that could be helped, uh, but for a whole bunch of reasons, some of them ex internal, some of them external, lack of access to treatment, cost, other kinds of stuff, some of them just internal, refusing to go or not wanting to go, too scared to go, um, you know, worried about stigma, they are not seeking treatment, uh, and that, you know, there's their take-home message for people listening in terms of raising awareness and, and uh, trying to encourage people to seek help and support because there is just there's wonderful help and support out there uh to to assist with these sorts of issues if people would only sort of take them up so i'll get off my soapbox <laughs> after that but just to, to sort of answer your question even for young kids uh there's really good success rates uh for the youngest of kids there's fantastic success rates just with parental education and training uh where uh a guy by the name of ron rapi who is a uh, he's a world authority on social anxiety in kids he works out of macquarie university uh in sydney australia uh has demonstrated 15 year lasting effects of having uh parents of three and four year old extremely shy kids get a parent intervention just the parents not even the kids uh and he's showing long lasting impacts when these kids are you know adolescents in terms of reducing the likelihood of having problems with anxiety, uh, which is, I mean, when you think about that, that's absolutely remarkable. We're talking about an eight-week, you know, one-hour-long session. Uh, so they get eight hours of training when the kid's four years old, and we're still seeing the effects of it 15 years later. It's absolutely remarkable. Um, there are other intervention programs, some of which I've been involved with, that are a little bit more intensive, that involve both parental education and training, some social skills training for kids. Uh, we, we bring in groups of young shy kids together in groups of four or five and we we do social skills training with puppets where we try to have them practice the kinds of skills that we want shy kids to learn how to do better like making eye contact initiating a conversation uh you know introducing yourself saying your name even this the sort of the simplest things that we would kind of take for granted that can be stressful for shy kids uh and then we have them play with each other supported by the group leaders uh, to try and reinforce and practice some of these skills. And we're demonstrating really uh, promising change over even just this short period of time, over eight weeks, uh, in terms of reducing uh, anxiety symptoms. But I think even more importantly, increasing positive social interactions back at school. Mm -hmm. So we've done observations of these kids pre and post. And uh, after the fact, as compared to a group that hadn't received the treatment, they're, they're playing more and they're playing at a more social, on a higher social level than they did beforehand. And for all the reasons that we talked about before, that kind of peer interaction is going to serve them extremely well moving forward. I'd like to ask you about some of the stressors or threats that show up when kids are getting a bit older into adolescence and high school. Uh, in particular, a couple of things that I've seen in my practice this tremendous um, sense of pressure that kids seem to be feeling more and more of these days to perform academically. I'll never forget, uh, it was early on uh, when I started my practice, a uh, parent approached me um, considering uh, getting some CBT for her daughter who was in grade five. And she said to me, you know, um, grade five isn't like grade four. It really starts to get serious now. And they have the government exams, and my daughter just can't handle it. Uh, and we really want her to do well. Uh, I just, I could not believe, like, the, it, it read to me like kind of a stereotype or something you'd, you'd, you'd read in a textbook that just seemed like way over the top. Mm -hmm. But I see it actually so often. Uh, and then, of course, in high school, maybe the stakes are getting a little higher. So what's your perspective on that sort of performance anxiety and and the sense that I have that it's really on the rise, that children are struggling a lot with this these days. Yeah, well, I mean, I, just listening to your description of that parent, I, w I, would, you know, I would wonder about her own issues around anxiety 
and expectations and perfectionism as I, I wouldn't doubt that some of that would have been passed down to her you know son or daughter but just on the, on your description of her behavior I would suggest CBT for her as well as CBT for her daughter I don't mean to make light of her situation but uh, certainly you know academic pressures I guess are going up as, as more and more people you know participate in in university you, you know there was a time not too many years ago when just having a university degree was enough to differentiate you from a good chunk of the population in terms of job opportunities uh these days now you know you have to go to the next level masters or beyond in order to be differentiated and even then there's a lot of phds who are having trouble finding jobs so the stakes have gone up i guess in terms of uh what's going to put you on the on the right path there has been decades of grade inflation that have raised the overall averages in in you know post-secondary and probably high schools as well um where you know when you think about it you know an average grade is supposed to be c right so people who get a c should be pretty happy they're doing just about average right i, I you know in in many communities right now that would be a, an unheard of bad achievement to get sort of an average grade so i, I certainly share your anecdotal uh perception of sort of everybody feeling like the stakes are going up for kids who tend to be shy there are uh, so many unique challenges of the educational context that can lead to even more pressure to achieve um so you know imagine you are a you know a five-year-old in kindergarten and you uh, you know and you tend to be shy show and tell is probably your worst nightmare that you could ever encounter right you've got to stand up in front of a bunch of other kids and talk about yourself with everybody looking at you and it's like part of your grade okay uh and so certainly whoever designed the, the academic curriculum from show and tell all the way up through to you know it's all group work now uh, all of the curriculum all right through the graduate school is about group participation uh speaking up in class being engaged in class uh you know you no longer sit and work quietly by yourself it's all small group work discuss it with your you know people sitting next to you and then come up with a group discussion about what's going on all of these sorts of uh you know emphasis on social participation communicative participation in class uh work against the natural instincts of kids who tend to be shy so that's certainly one set of stressors is just having to deal with the social evaluative concerns because you know guess what in school you are evaluated and you're going to have to speak in front of people and you are going to be evaluated and again that's those sorts of you know negative thoughts around those experiences are definitely amplified in in kids who tend to be shy uh, but even the school environment itself can be stressful there's lots of other kids around there's lots of new things happening um, you can imagine a situation where you are you know in elementary school sitting behind your desk and you're supposed to be paying attention people like to talk about the uh, inattentive kids who are looking out at the window at the butterflies that are flying by instead of paying attention in the class and so they have trouble because of that because they are getting seduced by these external stimuli you know for kids who might be a little bit more shy they're getting uh, distracted by internal stimuli right so they have this running inner dialogue instead of paying attention to what the teacher's saying they're thinking oh wow maybe the teacher's going to call on me I'm going to have to answer something what if I get it wrong what if everybody looks at me uh, what's going to happen at lunch when I have to go sit next to this kid who doesn't treat me nicely, who I don't know how to talk to. And so they might be distracted by their internal ruminations to the point where they're not paying as much attention as they could be. And the other thing that happens is, of course, teachers are using verbal participation and verbal responses to evaluate the students in their class's performance, right? Uh, and we know from some other research that if I'm a teacher with 30 kids in my class, and I'm going around and I'm asking each of them questions and I point to the shy kid and I ask them a math question and this kid knows the answer but when 29 other pairs of eyes turn around to look at them they get flustered and they can't get the answer out and then the teacher who has got 29 other kids that they have to pay attention to waits for a few seconds and moves on to the next kid but somewhere in the back of their head they've already filed away oh that kid's not very smart that kid didn't do his homework because he didn't know how to answer my question and they don't necessarily have the time energy or resources to get into the heads of all of the different reasons why this kid might not have answered the question and unfortunately we know that that can become sort of a self-fulfilling prophecy if a teacher doesn't think you're smart you actually do end up doing less well in in their class um, so there are lots of sort of institutionalized challenges for shy kids at school um, many of which could be you know lessened by just a little bit more raising of awareness among teachers and school board uh personnel and, and i'm very happy to report that, that that's happening 
certainly uh, over the last number of years, there's been, I think, a significant better understanding of these sorts of challenges at school. Uh, teachers are certainly, you know, they're motivated to do everything they can to help the students in their class. And it's just not reasonable to think that they're going to have this personalized uh, interaction style or evaluation style for the 30 different children in their class. They have to teach the class. They can't spend all their time trying to get this one child to talk to them. Having said that, there are, you know, various different techniques that they're starting to learn and that we've been trying to share that would allow them to at least, uh, you know, help level the playing field a little bit for some of these kids. All right. So my other uh, favorite stressor to talk about is the rise of the smartphone (laughs) and social media. So given that this is a social phenomenon, I'm guessing it has a big impact for these children as well. Yes, well, there are actually two competing theories about how this might work. Okay. So one of the theories is called the rich get richer hypothesis. And this is the idea that for kids who are sociable and outgoing and agreeable and personable and they have lots of friends, smartphones and the internet and social networks become just another platform, another context for them to have lots of friends and do well and be sociable. And it amplifies their already existing you know, face-to-face real relationships. And you can certainly imagine a situation where your best buddy is away for two weeks somewhere and you get a chance to talk to them every day and keep in touch with them because you've got them linked on your Facebook or Instagram or Twitter account or you're FaceTiming with them. Uh, So you can certainly imagine situations where these, you know, technologies can enhance and make things better for, uh, you know, for already existing relationships. Now, the other side of that is in the rich get richer hypothesis is that shy and anxious individuals is just another place where they're going to feel shy and anxious. It's another social milieu where they're going to struggle uh, and be less popular and, and be less socially skilled and worry. And it's just a, another domain where they're going to have problems. So that's sort of the, you know, that's just the internet and social media amplifying already existing uh, tendencies. The opposite hypothesis is called the social compensation hypothesis. And here is the suggestion that uh, that electronic communication or computer-mediated communication can be a really nice bridge for shy individuals into face-to-face communication. So if you're first getting to know someone or your first sort of uh, sets of interactions uh, have some of the stressors removed from them. So uh, face-to-face it can be a struggle for uh, people who tend to be shy because they're worried about how they look and their, their posture and how they're appearing to other people and they're misinterpreting eye contact and, and the expressions on other people's faces. So if you don't have to look at the person for your first set of communications, that's one stressor that's removed. They also feel pressure to respond right away. They get flustered and they don't have time to answer. So if you have asynchronous communication where you get a, you know, uh, an email or, or a, Uh, a text message and then you have a few minutes even just to think about how you want to reply before you reply that also takes some of the pressure off Uh, and there is some research to suggest that uh, you know people who tend to be socially anxious find that type of communication sort of less stressful initially and in an ideal world that would be a stepping stone right so those initial sets of communications are done via these commuter mediated channels and that helps you feel more comfortable which will pave the way for you know real life interaction unfortunately what sometimes ends up happening is uh it becomes a replacement for face-to-face and real communication and real interaction uh and some people who are socially vulnerable will you know seek out communities that they only interact with online uh and that's a potential danger because it it ultimately ends up taking away even more time from their Uh, efforts and abilities to interact face-to-face. And I think that's one of the concerns that people would have, I mean, not just about people who are socially anxious, but just about this generation in general, is that they're spending way too much time in this sort of upper level uh, communication and not enough time in sort of in-depth communication. Uh, But that would be a particular worry, I guess, for uh, for shy individuals. And there is some literature also linking uh, social anxiety with internet addiction and and problem uh, gaming and... uh, so uh, as a kind of a coping strategy, as an escapism for, you know, threatening social situations, you can escape into this other realm. So uh, I would say, even though this stuff has been around for a while, we're still in the earliest stages of understanding how it all works, mostly because it just keeps changing so quickly, right? So <laughs> if you look in the, in the literature right now, there's still a ton of, of Facebook studies coming out. 
uh, and how kids and Facebook and, you know, my teenagers will tell me that Facebook is for their grandparents. As soon as you and I go on Facebook, then, it's, you know, that's not the place where our kids want to be. So whatever their social network of choice is going to be, whatever their platform is going to be, once you and I show up there, they're not interested in being there anymore. And then for the next three or four years, when all the literature comes up, they've already moved on to something else. Uh, and so certainly the rapidly changing quality of what's going on online is, is, uh, is very hard to keep up with from a research perspective. Uh, so I would say we're still at the very early stages of understanding this. So I had a professor from California named Jean Twenge on the podcast uh, a little while ago, and she studies generations. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you've heard of her, but um, she wrote an important book on millennials, and she more recently just uh, published a book on the next generation after millennials that she's calling iGen. Mm -hmm. And the sort of defining characteristic of this generation is that they're the first generation to have smartphones in adolescence. Right. And, you know, she looks at these longitudinal data sets, uh, very, very large samples, like thousands of adolescents across the U.S. And she's saying that around, I think it's 2011, 2012, these like spikes that she'd never seen before uh, in measures of all kinds of mental health problems particularly depression, suicidality. I think she mentioned anxiety as well. And she sort of got puzzled, like, what's going on in in these kids' lives uh, in 2011 and 2012? And she sort of connected the dots with another research project she was working on, and that was the time when the number of kids with iPhones crossed the 50% threshold. <laughs> wow. Um, and so her thing, uh, as far as I understand, is that kids are getting impoverished experiences of socializing. And she's got this really nice phrase that if you're interacting on Instagram, it's sort of equivalent to eating Apple Jacks. Whereas if you're interacting in person live, it's like eating an apple. Hmm. Um, so just curious how that, uh, that lands with you. Uh, yeah, I'm I'm familiar with her her very important work. Uh, I, I mean, it's certainly, you know, as a parent of two teenagers, uh, the concerns certainly ring true, because you know our kids are on their smartphones a huge amount of time. Uh, you know, I have a 14 year old daughter, and she's certainly you know she didn't she's not allowed to take her phone to school. Although that will probably change next year when she goes to high school. But she comes home from elementary school, and the first thing she does is she runs in the door, she grabs her phone, and we don't, we don't see her for a while while she scrolls through and gets caught up on, on you know what's the latest on her Instagram account and whatever else she's she's into there. So you know, I mean, life has certainly changed in ways that I don't think we can completely understand as of yet. Um, I, I just don't know enough about the data to comment on the on the finding. I mean, it, it certainly sounds plausible, right? There is certainly uh, a mechanism that we can imagine where spending time looking down and punching with our fingers onto a screen is replacing time we would have normally had out on the street interacting with others. So I, I, I definitely, as a parent, I share those concerns. Uh, as a scientist, I'm, you know, the data is coming in not, and uh, some of it is a little bit alarming. But I still feel like we're at early stages about understanding what's going on. And like I said before, I feel like it's changing so quickly mm -hmm. that a conclusion that we can make about something is going to be outdated in a period of months and years instead of decades like it used to be. Um, so, yeah, so I, I have to sort of balance my personal concern as a parent with my, you know, academic, uh, you know, attempt at neutrality based on what the data says. Uh, but there is certainly data out there that gives us cause for concern. And I guess I'm still a little bit, you know, waiting to see what happens next. Because as with any new technology, there is a period of social adjustment, right? When the telephone was invented, there were cries that the day of the pop by visit to your neighbor was over. And we would never visit people in person anymore because we could talk to them on the phone. So if you look at any change in technology, there's always an accompanying historical, uh, you know, societal cry about this is changing everything for the worse. Uh, and I'm not sure that our generation is well equipped to understand what's happening to the next generation in terms of how they interact with this technology, because for them, it's so normative. And I've watched my, you know, students interact with each other in face to face while at the same time having their smartphones out. And they do it so fluidly uh, and so seamlessly talking to someone on the other end of the phone, plus the person there, plus pulling in information and showing each other clips and songs and quotes and things. 
it's it is definitely changing the way that we interact with each other and i i'm sure it's going to it's going to have consequences um and i guess we'll have to sort of see what what happens next in terms of where those consequences are leading i, I still feel a little bit like the jury is out uh in terms of where we're going but uh, that's my, that's my personal gut feeling as opposed to uh, you know a strong knowledge of the literature rob how has the stuff that you have learned and studied and published on affected how you parent your kids? Hmm. Well, you know, it's funny. I, I remember having this conversation with my mentor, Ken Rubin, many, many years ago, long before I was a parent. Uh, and he said, as we were learning about all this kind of stuff, and I, I sort of asked him, you know, exactly that question, you know, how has all of this affected you as a parent? And he said, the best piece of advice I can give you is when you're a parent, you got to just forget this stuff and, and go be with your kids. Um, and so on the one hand, that's been my philosophy is to not try to overanalyze and not try to over, uh, you know, take an academic approach to raising my kids. You raise your kids with your, you know, with your heart, uh, you know, your brain helps, of course, but, uh, yeah, you know, you're not trying to think about statistical results from an analysis of a, you know, of data when you're trying to make a decision about how to interact with your kids. Having said that, it's nice to have access to information. Uh, and there were certainly have been times uh, where I've wondered about, oh, my child's behaving like this, you know, what's, you know, what does that mean or what's a good way to respond? And I've, and I've done some searching around and I was very happy to have the resources to go and, and, uh, and look up stuff or talk to someone about it. Um, so it's nice to have some inside information. Um, but, uh, but I would say, you know, most of us parent more by our instinct than from anything else. Um, it did make me have some conversations with my wife Vanessa earlier on about our sort of our parenting strategies and my wife and I parent in very different ways but w the big things I think we agree upon uh, and we actually had that conversation long before we had kids about you know what are the most important things that we think we want to sort of uh, you know make as our priorities and then even though we express them in different ways I think there's a fair amount of consistency in those ideas. It's funny. I think you're the only person who doesn't parent exactly like his or her spouse. My <laughs> wife and I are always exactly on the same page. <laughs> I'd love to see that. <laughs> okay. I wonder if we can try to close the loop uh, from an earlier branch we took in the conversation about looking at children who are playing alone. Mm -hmm. And we talked about shy kids. And I'm I'm trying to be mindful of my, my language here. Right. But there, there are also the kids that might be playing alone because they're happy to do that right. and kids that are maybe left out or ostracized mm -hmm. or whatever. Maybe if you can, just uh, a, a little bit on how you would approach dealing with those other two categories. Sure. So uh, I, I would say, you know, the ostracized, rejected kids, I mean, there's been tons and tons and tons of research on this and, and I would not necessarily consider myself an expert on that particular domain, except to say that it's, it is extremely harmful. Uh, and there has luckily been a huge raising of awareness about the you know costs of being a victim, the cost of bullying, the cost of, of aggression in schools. Um, most schools have mandated anti-bullying programs these days, which is a huge step in the right direction. Um, that's not to say that there's not still a lot of aggression that goes on in schools. Bullying, cyberbullying, right? You know, there's a whole other domain where kids can be mean to each other online. Um, so I, I, I'll speak little about that uh, about that particular pathway, except to say that we know that it's a huge problem. It has implications for social, emotional, and academic functioning. Uh, and the, the best advice for parents is always intervene as early as possible. Uh, and, you know, what the intervention looks like really is a function of what's the cause, what are some of the underlying causes and reasons behind why this kid is, might be struggling socially, why they might be getting ostracized. Um, so the earliest research just looked at being rejected and victimized as a problem. I think we're at the point now where if we're talking about intervention, uh, it, you know, we also have to address some of the underlying causes about what's going on there. So I think I'll leave that there just in terms of that pathway. And I'll circle back to the second pathway that you were alluding to is about this child who might like to play by themselves. Um, and I must say, this is a topic I've becoming increasingly interested in over the last few years, because like I started started off by saying, you know, some time ago, solitude had a bad name and a bad reputation, but there's a smaller but still vocal subgroup of theorists and philosophers and others who have written very passionately about the benefits of being alone and the positive side of solitude. And there are some wonderful essays that espouse all of these wonderful uh, potential, uh, you know, uh, benefits of, of spending time alone for creativity and for self-discovery and 
uh, for spirituality, uh, for relaxation, restoration. All of these, you know, ideas have been raised in terms of what solitude can do for us. Uh, and at least as far as I can tell, there's way more sort of conceptual theoretical writing about this stuff than there is actual empirical research demonstrating these effects. Now, if you ask me what I believe in my gut, I will tell you that I think that uh, solitude is good for everybody. And under the right circumstances and under the right conditions, uh, it's something that would benefit everybody to spend some time alone. For some people probably have a higher need for that than others. And there are definitely individual differences in terms of what the ideal amount of time alone would be. Um, but I think that's something that uh, is good for everybody. And part of the research that I'm working on most recently is trying to actually get at you know, why that is the case. Show some actual empirical benefits because the active ingredient of solitude is still not well known. And let me explain to you what I mean by that. So uh, there's an interesting body of literature talking about the benefits of nature. Take a walk in the woods, be exposed to a natural environment, your breathing slows down, your heart rate slows down, the way that you process uh, your environment slows down. It's all, it's all good for you, okay? And there's a pretty good literature demonstrating that being in nature is good for us. Some people have interpreted that to saying being alone in nature is good for us. Take a walk in the woods and you're going to feel better. Um, but I don't think it's that clear. You could take a walk in the woods with a friend uh, or with two friends and your pet, and you might still experience the same benefits from being in that natural environment. So it's not immediately clear to me what specifically is special about being alone in that context. Okay? So there's sort of one example. Uh, here's something that you would know about. Uh, lots of evidence about the benefits of meditation and, and uh, taking a mindful approach to how we think and, and live our lives. Uh, and certainly, stereotypically, you think about meditation and mindfulness as a solitary activity. But of course, if we're good at that, if we are skilled at our meditative practice, we can sit down in the middle of a crowded street uh, or even be walking you know, I at a party with, a, uh, with 50 other people and a lot of noise in the background and we can engage in our mindful practice in a way that will be beneficial to us uh, that doesn't require physical solitude in order to reap the benefits of that practice. So part of what I'm really trying to understand is what is the sort of, again, the active ingredient? What is it about being alone? Is it about being disconnected from our phones? Is it about being disconnected from other stresses and stimuli that is going to allow us to recharge? And under what circumstances do we have to be physically alone for that to happen? If you like to read a book to feel better, will it be less effective if you're reading a book, you know, in a coffee shop with five other people around you or with your partner next to you in bed? You know, what are the actual limits of what is required to be alone? You know, what's the difference between physical solitude and our perception of being alone, our perceived aloneness, our perceived solitude? Uh, and I, I wish I had some good data to tell you about that stuff, but we're really just at the earliest stages of trying to understand it. Okay, Rob, um, is there anything else you think uh, we've missed or you'd like to add before we wrap up here? Yeah, I, I guess, you know, I'm always mindful of, of parents who are listening to me talk and and when i say you know this child is at risk for this or there's uh, they may have problems with this and you know the last thing i ever want to do is is be viewed as uh you know as, as pathologizing a personality trait and you know giving the worst case scenario of something and and so uh, i guess the always the positive message i try to leave with parents uh, you know if they're worried about their child who's shy and they think that this is some kind of life sentence that's going to you know uh, be a struggle for them their whole life and you know, and they push so hard to try to change them or they might get angry or frustrated with their behaviors. And, you know, I know it's, it sounds like a simple message, but, you know, you love your child for who they are. Uh, and it's important to recognize the positive sides and the strengths of every different kind of child and every different kind of personality trait. Uh, and the good aspects of, like we said before, sometimes it's really nice to have someone who's a little bit quiet. It's nice to have someone who's more tuned in to everybody else's feelings, who's more tuned into their environment and can assess things and evaluate things and be pensive and thoughtful and, uh, and, and sensitive to what's going on. There's a lot of, you know, very positive aspects to this kind of behavior. Uh, and there's a, you know, there can be a sweetness to, to these kind of quiet behaviors that, and, a, you know, a real good heartedness, I think. Uh, and, you know, we don't want to lose sight of that and, and lose track of that amidst the worry about what's it going to mean for my child when they have to get up and talk in front of their class or when they have to go to the child for the sports team or go to their piano lesson or something like that. Um, so it's really important to, to, to treasure the, you know, your child for who they are and what their personality traits, you know, bring out. Uh, and of course, 
help them and support them to be the best version of, of themselves. Uh, and maybe that's a good way of, of sort of finishing off, right? We're not trying to tell you to change your child's core personality trait. We're not trying to tell you to change who they are. We're just trying to provide you with a toolbox, a set of coping strategies that's going to help your child be the best version of who they can be. Rob, I'm listening to you and I'm sort of fantasizing about having you with me for the rest of the evening and maybe the rest of the week or the rest of my life, <laughs> just kind of coaching me on how to handle uh, each of these you know, challenging situations that we all have with our kids. And so uh, part of where I land with that is like, I just want more Rob Copeland. Uh, <laughs> so where can people get more Rob Copeland? Um, well, I guess the easiest way to interface with uh, with some of the stuff we've talked about is uh, actually wrote a book for teachers a couple of years ago uh, called Quiet at School. It's a teacher's guide for shy children. It was published by uh, a U.S. publishing house called Teachers College Press. Uh, you can find it on Amazon. Uh, and actually a lot of what we talked about, some of the positive aspects of shyness, sort of best practices for parents, as well as specific focus on stuff in the school environment is all laid out in that book. Uh, and uh, if people are interested in reading more, they are uh, certainly invited to go and have a look at that, and, and there's some other resources available on my website that they can find by Googling my name at Carlton, uh, and that'll point them in some other directions as well. All right, thanks so much for doing this. It was a real pleasure, and uh, I'm sure all our listeners will, will enjoy listening to all the advice and all the information, so thanks a lot. Thank you, Joe. Thanks for listening to the Mindspace podcast. The purpose of this project is to inspire people to cultivate well-being. The science tells us that well-being is best understood as a series of skills and habits that can be learned and practiced. And I hope listening to these episodes helps you move forward on your own path to well-being. If you enjoy listening to the Mindspace podcast, please share your favorite episodes with friends, family, and colleagues. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot.